All right, all right. I uh, am ready to come out with episode, the next episode. And I'm a little anxious about this one uh, in, a, in a good way. Uh, I sit down with Danny Aylesworth, who, let me just tell you how I, I, I found her. Um, you know, you're looking for people. I'm looking for people to come on and talk to me. Uh, about a, a range of, of subjects and uh, issues. Uh, and I just have a few requirements that guests have to sort of meet before I ask them to sit down with me. And one is that they have to be willing to meet me in person. Uh, two is that they have to be excited about what they're doing. You know, I want to feel like this person is very enthusiastic about what they've got going on. And three, there just has to be an interesting story. Like I've seen a lot of people get super excited about some basic stuff. And so an interesting story in my opinion. And you know, you know what opinions are like, but it's my opinion. So I saw Danny on social media and I noticed right away that she definitely is conveying a message, uh, a positive message. And normally what I do is I've look you know past that just for a second and try to come up with any reason why i should not pay attention to this person that's just my cynical nature that's what i do but after looking just at a surface level past danny's social media presence i realized that she has a very interesting story to tell and it starts with she was a, a soldier in the army assigned or attached i'm not sure what the correct verbiage is but she was assigned to a combat unit a special forces team seventh group and did a deployment in afghanistan as an ammunitions specialist also as a female interrogator in the field with her special forces team now i don't know what the official status of that activity is but i call that being in combat i call that being in combat and next to my combat experience she might as well be which is none but she might as well be rambo so that that seemed very interesting to me and i wanted to sit down and talk to danny about that alone but then i also found out that when she discharged from the army she fell into an addictive dependency on alcohol um as well as fought heart failure, died twice, needs a heart transplant, but some, some way through that managed to get herself together and back on a, a positive trajectory. And I wanted to talk to Danny about that. So please check out my next episode, What's the Big Idea with Danny Aylesworth. Am I keeping these on? Oh, no, you can take those off. I'm sorry. Haha, <laughs> I got her. <laughs> just kidding. Um, I just wondered why you didn't have any on. I didn't want to be by myself. I, no, it's a good uh, point. I don't, I don't like wearing them uh, when there's just two people talking because we can, like, tell who's talking. When there's four or five people talking, I guess it helps to, <laughs> to have those on so we're not all yelling at one another. It just made it feel even more a part of the process for me, so I would have worn them. That's awesome. So how are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Yeah. Um, I uh, am doing a podcast, obviously, and I'm new to the, to the genre, but I wanted to reach out and find other people who seem to be creating content, uh, trying to build a brand, it seems like, mm -hmm. uh, someone who's local. And someone who has uh, an interesting story, which is what sort of like drew me to wanting to have a conversation with you. Once I saw your your post and thought, oh, this is interesting. I like her message. And I took just a, a, a superficial dig past that. I recognized that uh, you might have a pretty interesting story to tell. And I wanted you to, uh, if you didn't mind, coming on and, and sharing your perspective about life, love, and liberty uh, with us. Maybe not in that order. Maybe not in that that order yeah sure and it's so nice to meet you that's actually what um made me want to reach back out or like acknowledge that you reached out i don't know the word right. is that you were local also and it kind you kind of aligned you also have done work with 
the doctor at the clinic that I yeah Point in. Washington Medical Clinic um, easily the greatest charity I've ever heard of I especially here in Walton County it's amazing I try not to cry every day when I go to work so I'm doing my internship for my bachelor's degree in social work so I'm the social worker out there and I'm going because I have to do it for clinical hours for a degree these people show up every day on their own because they like want to be it is the most selfless selfless kind group of people I have ever been around it's it's I beautiful agree. to be a part of. I, right. I and doing that. such, not only are they doing important work like on paper, it sounds great, but they're doing it well too, you know, yes. which is uh, sometimes a big distinction. So one of my first weeks there, somebody came in with cardiac issues. They did an echocardiogram, which for me takes months to get me, me, meaning just a normal person in advanced heart failure. Um, that's normal, but, uh, and it takes me months to get appointments and they're able to come to this walk-in clinic and on a cell phone with the little mini Doppler, get an entire cardiac exam. I mean, wow, that's impressive. I know. So you're right. It's not just that they have access to care. It's quality care. So good on you for being a part of that group. I, it found, I, I feel lucky. Yes. Right. Um, okay. So, so, but where, where are you from and, and, yes. and how'd you get here? Um, so I'm from Spokane, Washington. I'm from the West Coast, born and raised. Um, I joined the Army when I was 19. And Okay, left. pause right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what made you want to join the Army right out of high school, basically? Um, are you wanting, like, truths here? Uh, well, I mean, as much <laughs> as you want to say. I saw that my life wasn't really going anywhere. I've struggled with, um, I guess, addiction issues. I've, I've learned addiction is more of a behavior, but I've been dealing with that since I was young. Um, but I recognized early on that I was going to end up like my family, I guess. That sounds no. kind of harsh. If Addiction runs in your family? Yes. Mine too. Okay. So. And I, I try to be mindful when I share my journey because I don't mean for it to be hateful towards anyone else mm. or make anyone else look bad, but my reality is what it is. And that's why I joined the Army. That's the truth. A little bit is because I knew I'd never have the opportunity to go to school. Um, even with, like, scholarships and stuff, I still wasn't really in a place to even know how to seek out, nor did I have people around me that would have helped. I wouldn't have got there. So I joined the Army. and You I saw it as an opportunity yes. for a better life. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I also recognized that I was already early on kind of looking like, you know, my dad right, or my mom in certain ways. And I was like, I don't want this. I, I, I had seen what they ha had, it, how it had turned out for them. And I didn't want that. Mm -hmm. So I joined the army. My first duty station was Korea. I was so scared, but it ended up being my favorite duty station. Um, Where did you go to basic? South Carolina. Okay. Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I went to Alabama. What was what was boot camp like? I mean, had you ever been in an environment where someone was just going to yell at you about, hey, how you doing today? You know, I mean, they just... Well, I grew Drill up... sergeants are the funniest people on planet Earth, first of all. Yeah, but you're not allowed to laugh. <laughs> so it's really challenging, but they are. We had... I had one drill sergeant, and I went in 2008. Mm -hmm. So they were still allowed to cuss at you, call right. you names, put hands on you. I mean, it was a whole different world. But there was one where he had, a, there was a popular hip hop song out at the time and it was dropping Gimme 50 and he would just walk in a room and for no reason turn the song on on a speaker and just blare out to it and have a blast in his head. But we knew we had to drop and do 50 push ups while he like jammed to a song and it would be so funny. Yeah, they are the funniest individuals. But I came up like that with my parents yeah. or my mom. She yelled at me a lot. We had a drill sergeant who asked everybody who wanted to be airborne when they first got there yeah. and we were, we were a non-combat MOS. Nobody, you were in the military. I was in, I was in the army and nobody oh. was going airborne from, you know, our, my boot camp. but he asked who wanted to volunteer to be airborne. And then he pulled a chair up and everybody who had raised his, their hand, he got him up there in front of everybody and had him jump off the chair to do a roll. They're like, Oh, you're airborne now. Oh. And then he'd smoke them for volunteering for anything. <laughs> See? <laughs> yeah. But then if you don't, you get in trouble for not. Oh. There's a no win, but that's what they do to you. And I, and, I, and I try to tell my kids, you're going to have to get to a place in your life where you're okay with people yelling at you. Yes. You know, I mean, if you can't get there, then, 
um, then go to boot camp because they will get you there. <laughs> <laughs> I try and get that across my daughter too, but there's a, a fine line of boundaries too. You've got to be able to take somebody talking harsh to you Correct. or coming down, but there's a fine line between... We are not rug mats. Yeah, hurting yeah. your feelings and having your ego be hurt a little bit and right. somebody blatantly disrespecting you. I mean, there's that fine line as well, but I agree. You've got to toughen up a little bit. You know, balance in life. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what it's all about. Yeah. So you're 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 in Fort Jackson. You're doing boot camp. You get through boot camp. Mm. I found out I'm really good at calling cadence. There was a lot mm -hmm. of volume. spirit that comes yeah. out of there, right? <laughs> yeah, ready just to. Come yeah, out. I enjoyed marching. It was, uh, you know, maybe it was just a break from the torture. <laughs> maybe it was but, fun. You got some rhythm. You got right. some some music. It was the only time they, yeah, they weren't like ter terribly horrible to you. Maybe because they were running next to you, but. So you, you make it, what was your MOS right in? Um, 89 Bravo, which is an ammunition specialist. When okay. I joined, they told me at recruiting, I could be a chaplain's assistant, a rigger, a parachute rigger, or ammo. And at the time, they said that chaplain's assistants were getting deployed like immediately. Hmm. The other MOS required me to jump out of airplanes. I wasn't ready for all that. And that left ammo. Right. So off I went. Those recruiters, those are the only three jobs available. <laughs> you the know, only right? three, right? <laughs> with with no sort of, well, no, no, that's not true. Um, I ended up getting a bonus, so that was nice. Mm -hmm. I probably wasted it, but at the time it seemed sure. nice. <laughs> I, I think military service is great. Uh, you don't have to be in combat. You don't even have to be adjacent to combat. You can be a cook. You can be in finance. You can be in the band you can do a lot of things, and uh, it's great to have some to be in a situation that you can't run away from, and someone's going to not care about your feelings when they're telling you what you need to do. Not only that, there's accountability that comes with being in the military. There's a standard that's set for get your butt up and to work on time, and you know, stay in shape and do the things that it's going to take to make you just a normal citizen. You know, productive citizen. Productive. Of, yeah. Because a lot of us, in my experience, a lot of my friends, we came from similar home situations mm. where we might not have been taught what other people are, when other people call like basics or the norms, like the, it's not normal for everyone. And sometimes in the military, you're around a bunch of people that don't know you're supposed to wake up, make breakfast, get dressed. You know, Take a shower. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, it does illustrate that. I mean, some people, if you don't know, if you haven't been shown. Yeah. And that's in my own life, too. I grew up, you know, I would say fairly privileged, you know, in a middle class southern family. But even then, there's some things that you don't learn along the way yeah. that, you know, you you wish, you know, if you had a time machine, you'd go back and slap yourself around and, and, and say. Um, so you're in Korea. What was Korea like? Korea was interesting for me because... Um, I didn't drink, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And in Korea, everyone was heavy drinkers. And I'm not going to say I didn't go out and drink with my friends, but I wasn't as crazy about going out every night like they were. So I actually started um, volunteering at the elementary school that was up the road from Camp Carroll. And there I would teach English to fifth grade mm -hmm. Korean students, mm -hmm. which was so cool. Yeah. And mind you, I don't know a ton no, I wasn't teaching them Korean. I'm sorry. I was teaching the Korean children English. Right. Is that what I said? The first I, time? I knew what you meant. Okay, you meant what yeah. I knew. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you meant what I knew. I went in and would help them with English. And it wasn't a lot because... And you don't know a lot of Korean. Correct. <laughs> right. and, but they didn't know a lot of English either. And so even learning those basics, but getting that interaction. I also um, volunteered to help the Katusas because in Korea they have mandatory military terms. Okay. And... So I volunteered to teach them English on like my Saturdays. What are the Katusas? Katusas are m Korean military aged men that have been recruited to serve their two like years. Like conscripts or something like Every that? Every single, yes. Very, very That's interesting. That's actually a big word. I don't know. What that uh, well, I don't know what Katusa means, so we're even. K-A-T-U-S-A. -S I think it means Korean oh, something it's a, something to USA. It stands it's for It's an things. acronym. Got it. Oh, acronym. That's the... <laughs> <laughs> I nodded, but then I was like, I have no idea. You are an English teacher. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so you're in Korea. You, you, is that what happens after Korea? After Korea. Um, so I was on orders to Fort Hood, which is why I still have a Colleen phone number. Um, but I met my daughter's dad 
and we knew each other for like three whole weeks and we didn't want to quit dating and he mm-hmm. was on orders to Fort Hood. And so we were like, well, if we get married, I'll follow you because he outranked me. And if it doesn't work out, we'll just get divorced. Right. That's easy. Listen, at 20 years old, that seemed valid to <laughs> us. Right. So that's what we did. And um, I moved to North Carolina, and I was in the 82nd Airborne Division in 117 Air Cav. As an am- ammo yep, specialist. As an ammo specialist. Wow. Um, and then... What does an ammo specialist do in the field? Oh, man. Like downrange yeah. in the field? Yeah, I mean, or when in... you're really in the field. Not not on FTX, but... Oh, man. Um, Just everything... That... Real world, it was making sure the guys had what they needed. Um, I was a female counterpart for a special forces team. Mm -hmm. So our mission was a little bit different and I was able to work directly with my guys to find out what they needed on ground. And then we would come up with those munitions if we didn't have them, logistically figure out how to get them. Um, Wow. I, yeah. It's pretty close. Mm -hmm. And then while you're stateside, you're setting, you're making sure that your team i say teams because i was in a special forces unit and these team guys are required to train quarterly they get right. certain training so my job was to make sure they always had the ammunition for the training but project it for next the following year also basically making sure the guys had what they needed at all times so you're in north carolina mm-hmm. at fort bragg yep. assigned to the 82nd yeah how long are you there before you're assigned to the seventh, seventh group, group. Yeah. yeah so i was in the 82nd <clears throat> For about nine, nine or ten months, the unit was deployed and I was pregnant. So I was on rear detachment, painting and raking leaves. and That's the do whatever we need you butts. to do mm-hmm. phase of it. Yeah, I think yeah. I made a rock formation once and then had to make a all about face, which means mm-hmm. turn completely around. Paint the rocks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sweep the rain. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. So then I had my daughter while I was in the 82nd. And then maybe two months later, I came on orders to seventh group and seventh group as a whole unit moved down here to Florida. Mm. And that's and so that's how you ended up here. Correct. Gotcha. And what, I mean, I kind of know the answer to this question, but is, was the culture a lot different from the 82nd to the, to the special forces group? It was so different. The structure in the 82nd was nice. I mean, there was rules. You didn't walk in the grass. If you walked past somebody that outranked you, you gave them the greeting of the day. The military bearing was correct. Definitely an on display. Yeah, in the but 82nd. there's a lot of pride that's in that as well. You know, like I know people complain about it, but there's a lot of pride in that, and there's a lot of hard work that takes to getting to higher ranking. There's a lot of time that's put in that, and sometimes that respect is is due. Interesting. Whereas in seventh group, when I went over there, when I got promoted to sergeant, I mean, it was not. It was. It's not a big deal at all. It's right. Nothing over it. there. I'm not saying there's no tradition. I'm just saying there's other bigger issues going on and missions and things to worry about. And there's a ton of moving pieces. And so there's not a ton of it. You can walk with your hands in your pocket. You can walk across the grass. Sergeant Major is now Tom instead of Sergeant Major. Right. I'm now Danny instead of Sergeant, you know, whoever. So So it's kind of two different flavors. Yeah, which, but then there's a lot mm-hmm. of freedom. I got to do a lot of cool things, yeah. like a lot of cool things in, in a Special Forces unit. That I wouldn't have been able to do in a big army unit. Right. Um, yeah. So maybe my ego would have liked the big army better. Cause That's me. People would have. I can have, put my hands in my pocket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. Wear my hair long. Right. I get it. Um, so how long were you in Afghanistan? Ten and a half, eleven months. We were supposed to be home after nine, but we got stuck in like a sandstorm for three months. We couldn't get out, and then from Afghanistan, you have to fly to Manus, mm. stay there for a while. From there, you finally get home. So where were you in your enlistment when you got back from Afghanistan? Just about ready. I was supposed to reenlist, so I had actually reclassed to counterintelligence. Oh, cool. Which is why, while I was downrange, I was able to do downrange being deployed to Afghanistan. I was able to do female engagement team, combat support team stuff with the guys, so I embedded with the men. But it was only under because I had my top secret security clearance because when I came back, I was supposed to go through, go to school. And the idea is that when the guys are in there and they need to interrogate someone, culturally, it's very much frowned upon for a man to interrogate a woman. Correct. And there's also information that we can get, you know, from women that we might not be able, 
the men wouldn't be able to get on their own. Right. But then I was the NCO and then I had a female lieutenant and we were and then a female interpreter and that we were the only females there. But during our days we would teach the kid posh to the kids posh to just the alphabet. Once again, we're n- I'm not we're not teaching some this long sentences and s- grammar structure and all of that. We're teaching these children just their basic alphabet. Right. How to count what a letter is that's things that these kids wouldn't have gotten from the men a it's not their mission b they're not even allowed to have interaction with Mm. that part like that so you need women for that Mm. but you need women that are able to also have the capabilities i guess to switch over and play that other role as well so are you on patrol with yes well dismounted walking through well that's that's uh that's pretty hair raising yeah I have pictures. It's pretty cool. I got lucky enough because in 2011, Congress passed a law saying that women could be officially assigned to line units. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, in these special forces units, women had been attached in doing things with the men, but never assigned, never, you know. Part of the unit. Yes. Right. So I was the first one in seventh group to be assigned. Two weeks after this law got passed, I was on a plane to Afghanistan. Wow. No pre-deployment training. I had a 14-month-old daughter at home. You had no idea what you were about to step into. Not a single idea. Wow. And on top of that, the guys didn't want me there. They didn't want me there for a very long time. So I was completely wrong. (laughs) Well, I just suggested that maybe it was a more, uh, you know, a tighter brotherhood of of, of maybe of a welcoming group. But they they kind of felt like maybe. No, it was the opposite. Yeah. You were were sort of a distraction even maybe. That. Their wives didn't like it. Um they they didn't like it right i mean they f- i i feel like they i don't know what it was i don't know if they didn't well, like a, me doing the same stuff they were doing or the woman male part i don't understand. as if you had a choice you know, you know. <laughs> yeah yeah i don't understand the male psyche i don't know. well neither do i <laughs> yeah but it wasn't it was not as welcoming as people think yeah because that's my impression that it would be sort of this cool moment to to you know embrace a, a a woman coming and doing a job you know it's not like you were maybe correct me if i'm wrong but you weren't you know the spearhead of the stack kicking the door open you know going through but still you were in the area mm-hmm. you know part of that that just seems cool to me and especially being that there is a really valuable component you can bring to the table that some you know knuckle dragger you know is not going to exactly. be able to bring to the table have you seen do you listen to jocko podcast at all no okay they had it's so interesting because your story aligns so much with this Canadian infantry officer or int- infantry person named Kelsey. I don't forget her last name, but she was attached to a special forces Canadian unit, basically saw combat, saw some of her friends get, get killed and, and then struggled with addiction, you know, yeah, after she came home and felt like that the military had sort of abandoned her. Because I don't think they knew what to do with her. You know, not that it was on purpose, like, go away, we don't want to deal with this, but just sort of like, we don't really know what to do with this sort of trauma, especially in, you know. very familiar. Yeah. So, so, but you're. the same. I know, it's, it, it is it is remarkably similar now that I'm listening to your story. And, and I'll link you to that um, episode because yeah. her treatment method was, uh, it was uh, we won't talk about it here because it's a little controversial, but. Not that I'm afraid of controversy, but I don't know if you are. <laughs> um, but the the treatment that she went through was was interesting. Um, so you're in you're in Afghanistan mm-hmm. and you're doing your job with the seventh uh, group. So I'm the ammo, and then I felt the need to I guess keep up with the guys, and I started volunteering to go outside the wire to where go to the outposts with where they had f- these female engagement women. Mm-hmm. Um, not women. I mean, there was only two of us, but posts that were had the demographic around them in the village in the village platforms where it was even okay to go outside the wire and work with the kids. I see. That's I don't know how to word that, but yeah. So, um, I started volunteering to get out. I s- getting flown by rotary ring to the middle of nowhere as wow. the only female. Are you scared during yeah, all this? Yeah, <laughs> so scared. One time. It was midnight. We had to fly by night. There had just been a green on blue attack. Five of my friends had gotten shot. One's dead. 
I had just talked to him like 30 minutes prior. Wow. The CST girls were traumatized and had to go home, meet the female girls, because they got into the firefight as well. And so guess what? I volunteered to go out there. Why? I don't know. I wanted I wanted to be a, I wanted that camaraderie too, maybe, you know. So we fly by night in a Chinook with uh, night vision goggles on. By the way, never had used those before. They're like, when we land, get off and get up. I mean, the area was like hot. Like, they'll shoot you if they see you. I didn't know that your depth perception is completely taken away when you have night vision goggles on. And so I have a ruck on because I'm about to go live out here for the next five days. So I got a heavy backpack on, my weapon, these weird MVGs I've never worn before. I'm so scared. I can't see. And then, like, I'm Holy walking shit. like a crazy <laughs> alien. The pe- Have you ever seen the movie Three Kings um, with no. Ice Cube and Mark Wahlberg? And- but I'm imagining, like, flip-flops on or the big flippers on your there's, feet. And- there's a scene where they launch something in the air and some of the, the locals come out with gas masks on and lead them back to the way. That's what I felt like we looked like. We just looked like, yeah. Like space aliens? <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. It was so wow. scary. I mean, I, I can't imagine. As someone who contemplated you know trying to do that kind of work and then you know laying that over on top of you coming you know in this is like i'm just joining the army i don't know quite what to do and then you find yourself in the middle of afghanistan i mean that has got to be just you know an incredible experience that i don't think that you would take back but at the same time i mean i don't know it's it's really i had um i had a start major at the time begging me to not go like they had tried to put me on orders from the the main group down to the battalion and the group sergeant major didn't want me to go he's like you just had a baby you need to go to school yeah all of those sound like really good reasons he was yes he was older and wise and had daughters (laughs) and i he's like you have a family yeah yeah. i lost my family i mean i i Mm. divorced my husband in afghanistan i saw my first firefight like was in my first firefight real life one and I don't know what happened. I came back and I started drinking with the team guys and everything changed. And that's when I started drinking, divorced my husband. Why did this lawyer agree to let me get, like, why? Money talks, I guess. I know. I came home divorced. I was gone 11 months, left married, came home divorced. Right. Well, it's a big, I mean, a a lot's happening there. So, I mean, who knows, you know, the effects that that has on the decisions we make, um, how how long did you stay wrapped up, you know, with a with Drinking. active addiction? Six years, six okay. and a half years. Well, I got you beat there. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, my behavior goes back to childhood. Sure. The active alcoholism. From Which is like gasoline on the fire. Man, I still remember the bite. Like to me, I it, it like latched on to me. Mm. I didn't. Well, it works so well mm. to numb out the thing that we really don't want to focus on. Uh, and it works. Yes. It works really well. And if it didn't come with all the other side effects, I'd probably still be drinking. Yes. You yeah. know. So um, you struggle. You're, oh, you're absolutely. Uh, I drank early as a child for fun. Mm-hmm. And then things in life happen like they always do to everybody. No matter who you are, it's all relative. You know, my problems are huge to me, even yeah. though they may seem very tiny compared to your problems. And alcohol works. You know, it shuts off that part of your brain that says these are things that you really need to figure out because, you know, they're biting you. And 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 alcohol turns that off. And then it's just bad for you, right? I mean, it poisons your body. It mm-hmm. makes you lazy. It adds it calories your to your diet. Too, though. You know, it just there's so many negative things for that one little 25 or 30 minute period of time that it's great. You know, the first couple of drinks and you're hanging out with your buddies and the conversations flow in a little better and maybe you're a little taller and a little stronger uh that lasts you know but for a minute and then all the other crap comes rolling in but six years is enough time to you know really get a a good feel of it to pretty much destroy everything yeah (laughs) just it was all it it was gone but with that i was struggling with a lot a lot of ptsd a lot of it And I didn't feel like I had anywhere to turn or anyone to talk to. And for a long time, I thought I needed someone that had been through what I had been through Mm. to talk to them. And there wasn't many people that had been through what I had been through. That's one of the hard parts of, you know, being one of few is you're one of few. Right. Um, I'm very thankful to know now. I, I just need someone safe 
to fill space with me, mm-hmm. someone I feel safe with to, to fill space. But for years, I was like, you won't understand. Or I would go to counseling and they would start crying. And that's the last thing I wanted. I don't mean to laugh. Do you uh, know? <laughs> no, I've never made my therapist cry. But like they that start would be crying a... and I'm like, now I feel like I have to take care of you <laughs> and make you feel better. And now I want my money back and I had to feel bad to even, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, that's awesome. Um, I hope that didn't happen more than once or twice. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it did, but now. What was the, where were you, what was going on when you were like, I got to change this. This has got to stop. 2019. Um, I had gone into heart failure in 2000. Decem- you were still drinking while you. Yeah. Oh, okay. In December, 2017. Um, I went, I got misdiagnosed by the VA and went, ended up going septic with a viral pneumonia. When I went septic with the pneumonia, the virus attacked my heart. I went into a 12-day coma and woke up with 8% of my heart working. Heart failure, you're dying, you need a heart transplant like Holy yesterday. Shit. I was asleep 12 days, woke up Christmas Eve, nothing was working. I didn't know how to walk. I had to teach myself how to talk again. I mean, the whole... Can we can we back up? Yeah. So you're sitting around and you start feeling sick. Yeah. And you go to the doctor yeah, and the they're VA. like, you've got pneumonia. She said, you're young. No, this is the misdiagnosis <laughs> part. I drove all an hour away to the next city over where our VA is and told them, um, I like wearing makeup. And I had, I wasn't able to do my makeup without getting tired, which was weird for me. It was enough to make me go to the doctor. I couldn't put my makeup on. Um, and she said, <laughs> she said, well, you're young, you're fit. Um, I don't think I hear anything set me on my way gave me medication for an upper respiratory infection but I had pneumonia and had she done a chest x-ray she would have seen it but she didn't so we didn't catch it so when did you go back to the doctor I didn't when I uh went into December 17th 12th what's the gap there 12 three weeks three weeks so misdiagnosis three weeks later you pass out the Destin ER just like I couldn't breathe. Mm. They call an ambulance from Fort Walton. They said, you're too sick for us here. You have to go to Fort Walton. I get to Fort Walton. They induce me in a coma and fly me to Alabama where I What were your symptoms days. for those three weeks? Just kind of slowly getting Fluid worse? retention. I couldn't yeah. breathe. I was so tired. Yeah. I had a cough. Um, tired. Fluid overloaded. Big time. Wow. So now you're just like, I can't even stand up. They they emergency line you to another hospital. Yes. And then that hospital. Do you remember being there? Fort Walton? No, I don't. So you're unconscious and then 12 days later. I was later... awake. They had me signing paperwork. Oh, wow. But I was septic at this time. Wow. They had me signing uh, death paperwork, thought I was going to die. They called my mom in Washington State, who I wouldn't have called. <laughs> <laughs> None of my friends would have had them call her, but it's fine. They call her because I was they were positive I wasn't going to make it to Alabama, to wow. UAB, and I wasn't married, so she was my next of kin. So they had to call her to find out what to do with my body. So, wow. Yeah. But 12 days later, you wake up. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, and you can't raise your arms. Up. You don't really know why you're there, what's going on. No, and my ex-husband... My current boyfriend well, and my mom are all in the same room at the foot so of my bed. So this is like some sort of twisted uh, Christmas carol. <laughs> I didn't remember even getting put into the coma, so I didn't even know. And there was like tubes and IVs and doctors around me saying, does your stomach hurt? And I still remember this blonde nurse. She goes, oop, more fentanyl. She was so excited to give me fentanyl because I had just had Come a, out of it. a blood transfusion Oh yeah, and needed three liters of blood i guess i had a big ulcer in my stomach and she was so excited to make me feel better because she knew i was in pain hey i think they were just excited i woke up but that is quite a a a nightmare yeah and imagine my daughter she was seven and a half at the time and then her dad who was active duty special forces now had to be primary parent because i've been primary parent up until this Mm -hmm. point i mean like he's he's never been an absent parent but like yeah he was, he was in the stuff. army. Yeah, yeah, I was out. Not anymore. I mean, everybody's world just kind of. Wow. And this is in 2019, almost 2019. 18. But Christmas Eve, 2018. So you're moving into. 17. Into oh, 18. okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. 18, I moved to Houston for a heart transplant. 18, I get denied the heart transplant after six months of being there because I can't, can't quit drinking. 
the medical condition was not brought on by drinking. No, they thought they thought it might have been. But they cut a piece of my neck out. You can still see the scar here. Mm -hmm. They sent it to Mayo Clinic, and it was from the virus. that It, it was a viral pneumonia that attacked my heart. So it wasn't the booze, but my cardiologist said sometimes lightning strikes the same place twice. Mm. And I went into heart failure. Alcohol didn't get me sick, but alcohol kept me there. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty I'm I'm pretty sure I might have been able to recover maybe some of my heart output a little quicker had I not have been hindering it with gallons of vodka. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But you were you were turned down for the heart transplant. Mm -hmm. Was it because of the alcohol? Yes. Yeah. And so was that the moment that you felt enough pain to quit drinking? Because that's what it took for me. Something had to happen that would hurt enough yeah. that the pain of change was less than, you know, the pain that I was sitting in. That's what happened for me, too. But yeah. it wasn't with that situation. Yeah. So <laughs> what, what, what could oh, possibly no. be worse than that? Oh, it's so. Oh, my God. We didn't know. I mean, you know, we don't have to talk about it. Oh, we can talk about it. Okay. But I'm like, God, I wish that was the end. And I have a hard time with that. And there's a lot of judgment that comes from people because, like, you couldn't even quit drinking to save your own life. But you people don't understand addiction. And nor was it drinking a bottle a day like I was before. Mind you, I was 30 years old at this time and still was visiting here. Um, here, the local area that I'm at, where there's local wine walks all the time. There's a lot of events that are centered around mm -hmm. wine or champagne or something. I mean, we live at the beach. It's Correct. about coming to It's drink. about booze. Yeah. And so I would come home and visit my friends and do wine walks. That is inability to refrain from alcohol. It doesn't matter if you're drinking every day alcoholically. Some people like to be like, automatically jump to that of me in their head. But no, it, it was... No alcohol. Six mm -hmm. months. This is this is somebody that died. Right. Their organ that we're going to give you and save your life. I couldn't even, you know, if you can't take it serious. Now with that, um, they told you to quit, but they did. I wasn't really given too many um, tools to quit. It was just stop. I wish I would have known. D did you think that you were drinking alcoholically yes. you, okay so you felt like i need to quit yeah i yeah. was a drinker that um had delirium tremens every time like if i quit drinking i had to go to the er and get on ativan because i would have seizures and i have had seizures and passed out wow. in public um the day of my cardiac arrest i was trying to withdraw on my own because i didn't want to tell the doctors mm that I had been drinking again. It's like I could never get past 30 days. Mm -hmm. No matter how hard I tried, I even wrote it down one time. I found the notes to myself. Like, I don't want to drink. Why Why do I have to keep doing this? It was... I get it. Yeah. I totally get it. You know, I, um, from my experience, there's there's two types, and there's a lot of different types, but I, you can sort of categorize them in, into two types. There's the folks who know they drink too much and want to quit. Yeah. And then there's the folks who don't know, or maybe they know, but they don't want to quit. They don't want to quit. And I don't know which two is worse. Like yeah. not knowing that you need to quit, but at least saying, I don't want to quit. I'm not going to try to quit. I don't want to quit. Or the, or the guy that was like me who says, man, I really wish I could quit, mm, but, but too. I, but I couldn't quit drinking a little bit every day, not blackout drinking, not belligerently drunk, you know, every day, but I might have two or three or four or 10, you know, every day, every other day. Certainly since I started drinking in the ninth grade, mm. I probably hadn't put together six months of consistent sobriety until I was 43 years old. I can, I can relate to that. You know, so, and I think, I think a lot of people are like that. You know, they just kind of drink enough to where it's, you know, is it good for you? No, we, we know it's not good for you. But they're not having big problems in their life. And so the pain, yeah, right, relative. It's all relative. But the pain of whatever problems they're having is not enough to sort of, you or know, Or they just accept change. that pain. That's, I think so, yeah. You ugh. get used to it. It's like a bad smell, you, you know. just think you can't get rid of it. Yeah, that ego <laughs> nose blind. Yeah, you just all of a sudden you don't smell it anymore. Yeah, I know. Um, but so, so you're denied the heart transplant. Yeah. And I'm in Houston, Texas, which isn't where I'm from. I moved there because we don't have hospitals here and doctors here that I that do transplants. So I have to move to Houston. I move in with my daughter's dad's family because they live there. My daughter's here with her dad. Um, 
And then I was like, shoot, I got denied. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. So I moved to Washington State where I'm from. How's your health at this point in time? Awful. Horrible. I mean, I'm having seizures in Walmart. I just had had two cardiac arrests. I'm 80 pounds of fluid on me. Oh, I'm wow. passing out during stress tests to see what my oxygen is. I am literally leaking fluid from in between my fingers. Wow. Like, I was rotting. I was so sick. I was so sick. Um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have any friends or family. Um, and so. What are you doing for money? Or exactly. Right. Yeah. So after I'm leaving my heart transplant workup stuff, I'm door dashing yeah. to try and get money just to pay as I'm in like actively dying. People are just like, it's <laughs> crazy. They scattered. I mean, nobody wow. was there, right. you know, just I'm door dashing as I'm actively dying, bringing people food. Um, thankfully when I got sick, I had good credit. Uh, and so I was able to take out a loan and I paid six months of an apartment because you have to have income to get an apartment. And I didn't have that. I couldn't work. And so I told the lady like, listen, I need somewhere to live. So I paid her six months in advance, which was fine. I didn't think I was going to live to have to pay it back. I did live and I'm still paying it back by the way. Um, um, and so I was waiting for disability to kick in, but that t it took almost a year. Um, and so I hustled. I had some church people that would put together, you know, GoFundMes. I had, um, a friend here that would send me a small check that would cover my electricity. Other than that, it was door dashing, not eating much. I would check into the hospital a lot just so I had food to yeah. eat and company. Wow. I wasn't by myself. You still drinking? During, no. Yeah, you had quit by then? I was, I was. Probably didn't have the money to drink. I mean, it's like. I was fighting my sobriety. I was, yeah. I couldn't keep longer than two weeks, three weeks. So, so what, I would go to the hospital mm -hmm. and just try and be there. I wouldn't drink at the hospital. Right. But then I'm lying to him, telling him I'm hurting, staying high on Dilaudid and morphine the whole time while I'm there. Right. It was a weird time to get sick. <sighs> <laughs> Man, and I mean, we're, this is in 18 still? Yep. So COVID's right around the corner. Yep, so then yeah. I get denied, and... Maybe you had the first case of COVID that nobody I've heard about. somebody say that yeah. before, because it was a weird thing nobody could figure out. It was resistant to all the antibiotics. So then I get married to my third husband. I didn't even tell you about the second one, but... <laughs> we can skip over number Thank two. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was a bad idea. Um, the third one was more when you're married, the military will move your stuff. Mm -hmm. And now, because I was stuck in Houston, I didn't know how to get my stuff um, anywhere. I didn't have money like that. I was dying. So he got stationed in Washington. He joined the Army. Got stationed in Washington by chance, where I'm from. And I was like, well, let's get married. And then the Army will move all of my stuff back home. Then I'll have my stuff. I'll keep my daughter. Everything will be great. That didn't work out so well. He was, it was a horrible marriage. I was still drinking. My daughter's dad wouldn't just let her live with me in Washington away from him. I wasn't expecting it to be as hard to just take my daughter as it was. Right. Um, I went to the, and this is where I, everything kind of changed. It was November 19th, 2019. And I just recently started talking about this because there was a lot of shame around it. And I had gone to the VA t a day prior in Fort Lewis area and I told him I felt like I'm spiraling I just I couldn't stay sober I knew I was messing everything up I knew my daughter was now with her her dad which wasn't ever supposed to happen that was just supposed to be while I was sick yet I was having a harder time than I thought getting her it just I was feeling overwhelmed and I knew I've I've struggled with depression my whole life and I've struggled with a lot of mental health stuff my mom has her own severe mental health stuff so I just knew I was in trouble. I could feel it. I could just feel it. It was like impending. How long it had been since you'd been drinking or were you still doing prescription drugs as part of like, no. so how long had it been? So, so you know, how long had you been sober? A two weeks that time. Got I it. mean, up until this so point, I had never had any you're like feeling stuff yes. for the first time. And I'm like, maybe that's what it was. Maybe I was just getting, nobody told me feelings were going to feel like that. Right. And so, uh, they gave me Xanax. They gave me a bottle of Xanax to get to Monday to talk to a mental health. This was on a Friday. I got arrested Saturday for, like, lashing out at my husband. Okay. Domestic, like, 
was stuck. Right. Thankfully. Do you remember it? Because Xanax is a great amnesia. Um, I remember what the, I know what the court thing says. No. Yeah. And I know what was happening before. And I know the whole situation <laughs> was really messed up. It was a lot of, that's a whole nother, sure. a whole nother, th- a whole nother topic, but. I ended up getting arrested for assault on my hu- my husband at the then time. And in AA, I had been in and out of the rooms for years. They say jails, institutions, and death. And so I had never been to jail in my life. I had never been to jail. This was the first one. Huh? Yes, it was. And I prided yeah. myself on that. Like, eh, I'm be- you know how we do. Like, well, at least I'm not like them. Or at least I haven't been arrested. Never a DV. How? I don't know. I've been in accidents. I've been pulled over while under the influence and I'm I'm blessed. I'm thankful. I've heard, I've heard of these these uh, fairy tale cases <laughs> before. No, I, no arrests and I don't and no take DUIs. In, listen, I I am not condoning anything, and of course. I understand it. I I understand, but I'm very thankful mm-hmm. that I never did. So this was my first time in jail, in heart failure. Wow. They wouldn't give me any of my medicine, so I was getting worse by the minute. Oh God, it was so bad. I had girls in there saying. Oh, man, I'm surprised they put you with us in general population with you being so sick. Most girls would get jumped. And I'm like, I told the judge, um, I forgot the question, but this is just so funny. I told the judge. I think it said how long you had been sober. Oh, I hadn't been. This this was two weeks. This is what set it off getting sober. This was my D-Day. This was it. Jails, institutions, and death. Mm -hmm. And I had already had death. I had the cardiac arrest. I had already had institutions because I had been to treatment four times and now I was in jail and I just sat there and I was like, Danny, what else? When are you going to quit digging? I hit all three. Most people get two, you know, jails and institutions. I decided to go for all three jails, institutions and death. And I was like, there's nothing left and this isn't a life. I didn't want to do it anymore, nor did I want to go back to jail because in Afghanistan, you're able to have a gun in jail. You cannot have a gun. And I had no business fighting anybody because I, I didn't have the strength. Right. I told the judge that. I told her it was scarier for me in jail, those 22 hours, than it was in 11 months in Afghanistan. I get it. <laughs> also been to jail. Have you, see, <laughs> I, I had carried so much shame in that because... You know, yeah, I don't know. I mean, how much could you possibly know about yourself if you've never been arrested? <laughs> <laughs> Listen to you. want to hear? It's not funny again. It's not funny. But I, I, 60 days in is like a big thing. And I love all these like arrest show cop shows. So when the cop comes in to the house, I thought I was being so cool. And I'm like, I'm not talking to anybody like i'm like they're there for me murdering somebody or something like no i should have right. looking back i should have told them what happened right. because what happened i'm not even gonna get into it but it wasn't it wasn't really what happened right but i instead i was like i'm not talking to anybody I'll see you in court I'll see you in court <laughs> oh my god all right we'll take you to jail help they you get sure there. did too yeah. Oh my God! Man, so those crazy. guys—they don't—I I don't say they don't care, but they're like, we're not going to figure this out. Just everybody come with us, and you know, we'll I thought let the they would pry more f- information. They didn't. Right. And they were like, okay, weird girl, <laughs> let's go. So twenty-two hours in the in the clink. Yeah. And you get out. That and, was it. And you said, I, "I'm going to do something different." Yep. I sought out a uh, rehab, and not just a rehab. This one had to be different. Everything had to be different this time. So I sought out one that dealt with, um, it was trauma-based. Mm. So we dealt with the alcoholism a little bit, but I learned more about addiction as a disease. Mm. And I learned more about my childhood trauma and how it's presenting, and then you add war PTSD, and then you add relationship, bad relationships that I've been into, and learn more about the behavior. And what I could change in my behavior. And once I started learning that and realizing it's not that I was born broken. I don't have a malfunction in my code. It's that I'm maladapted. Okay. But I can readapt. I'm just doing it at 30. And it's a little embarrassing sometimes because other people have their crap together. Mm, well, not, but what's not more, really. <laughs> they seem to. But then yeah. I thought, like, what's more uncomfortable? Staying that 34-year-old that has nothing going for her or mm. letting people see me at least trying. And I decided... You know, yeah, better. I think that's I think that's exactly right. I'd rather at least try, you know, and, and that's what alcohol did for me was sort of just make it OK not to try. Yeah. You know, and it's just such a miserable place to, to be in. And something clicked along the way because I, I also went to to rehab, a 30 day rehab mm-hmm. in Boulder, Colorado. 
and uh, I was embarrassed to go, you know, wish I had gone years ago because it worked for me. And really what it was. The first time? The first time. Yeah. And what really what it was, was an opportunity to put my phone down, to concentrate on nothing else, but what I was going to do when I woke up in the morning and, you know, thinking about where I was, how I got here, what I'd been doing, what I wanted to do. And I think that you need that time to let it set in. You know, you need two weeks, three weeks, a month to even have a foothold of saying, you know, the the feeling that I need to drink, the habit of it, you know, the the good Mm -hmm. feeling that I get when I go and order my makers and ginger at happy hour and see my buddies, you know, whatever that dopamine rush is, you know, has got to kind of subside because the, 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 the negative consequences of doing that every day pile up. They do. You know, and it's the death by a thousand cuts in a lot of ways. It sounds, it sounds like you went sort of hard in the paint, you know, I didn't, right off the bat. Yeah. Well, the, the second husband had a lot to do in that, mm-hmm. a lot to do in that. He was a uh, 12 years older than me and had 20 years drinking experience on me. And he drank a bottle a day wow. and I drank. So I, I taught myself to drink. I'm talking a bottle of vodka a day in like 10 minis. Wow. Every day for six years. That's a lot. Too much. That's crazy. That's insane. But I was still able to go to work and I was still able to do the things. And it you just... know, I wonder though, sometimes there's not one's better than the other, but the slow progression of a few drinks every day for 20 yeah. years is one thing. And then, you know, hey, I'm going to just. I'm going to burn the candle at both ends of the, of the stick, (laughs) you know, is another way of approaching it. And I don't know which way is better, but you know, you, you've got some time, uh, at least on me too, especially because you know, you're, you're getting started a lot earlier. And I know that probably feels like to you, like you've wasted a lot of time, but you know, to older people looking back, it feels like, Hey, good for you that you got it. Yeah. It's good to hear that too. Sometimes I, I have a community that I talk with too. And it's nice to be reminded of that. Cause I do feel like that sometimes it's like, God, I missed, mm-hmm. I, but I didn't miss anything. In I life. think it's human nature. I, I remember being 22 years old, driving home from my grandparents' house in Troy, Alabama, looking out the window going, my life is over. <laughs> you know? And probably really feeling, really that. feeling like, cause I think I was, I think I was dropping out of college, you know, giving up a football scholarship because I was unfocused and didn't really know what I wanted to do, yeah. you know, um, and just being sort of un- rudderless, you know, with no direction and feeling like, oh, you know, I'm 22 and I haven't done it yet. You know, yeah. what, a, what a joke. Oh uh, but, you know, you don't know until you know, you know, it takes what it takes and all those great cliches. Um, yeah. But but you got to go through that. Some people get it sooner. And I've always wondered that, too. Like, even with my daughter's friends, I can already see in these 12 year old girls you know, your focused ones and your ones that are easily distracted and your ones that might like a little bit more attention than some of the others. And you're e- even at a young age, it's almost like, I wonder what it is why some of us just don't have that direction and or we'll have it all laid out, like you said. You know, maybe it just comes differently for, you know, different people. And with my own kids, I see a stark difference in their personalities, yeah. right? I mean, that's cliche as well, that two <laughs> kids are so different. And I think that as a parent, you you know, probably agree with this. The best we can do is just foster an environment yeah. that brings out, you know, the, the, the positive behaviors yeah. that, you know, they exhibit anyways. I don't, if it, I, th- I feel like if I'm forcing my kids too much in a direction, then, you know, I'm not handling the situation properly. I should more be focusing, focused on fostering an environment where they, you know, feel comfortable sort of naturally becoming what it is that is positive, you know, for them individually, because they're so different. And if I tried to push on to Eli, the same thing that works with Gibson, then I'm going to get a Frankenstein. <laughs> I'm going to get a monster. Yeah. Um, but but That's I, good I you're love, aware of I that, love though. being a dad. I love being a dad. It's the one thing I haven't screwed up too much, yeah. you know. So, but you're, you're, you're out, you're coming out of this moment in your life where you're like, enough is enough. And I'm, it was too much. I, yeah. I didn't want to go back. I couldn't imagine. Did you get a heart transplant or what happens next with your health? So I, let me see. So I get out of treatment a week later, COVID hits. I'm in Washington state lockdown meetings get shut down. Mm -hmm. 
no AA meetings. I had just gotten but out of treatment. the liquor store was open. Hell yeah, they were. <laughs> <laughs> I had just gotten out of treatment and like now I can't even go to meetings anymore. Right. So I fell into Zoom meetings. Um, for the first year, I stayed in Washington. And then as soon as that first year hits, they say in recovery that first year, you're not supposed to make any big decisions. Literally a month before that, that year, I was on my way back to here, moving back because I decided... Um, it would be better to keep, if I'm truly thinking for the best, what's best for my daughter, it wouldn't be to take her away from her dad in Washington, especially because he wants to be a part of her life mm -hmm. and he is a good dad while he, you know, in her life. So I was like, okay, this is, I had, I realized I started having to make decisions or I was going to fall back into where I had just come from and I didn't want that. And so today is just that momentum. I let, I flew, I left and moved back here January 5th, 2021. So I'm coming up on two years back. Um, I worked nationally with the American Heart Association um, and did their Go Red for Women campaign for a whole year. So that was great. It gave me something to focus on. Completely health, everything too. Sharing my story, encouraging people to learn CPR, encouraging them to eat right, which kept me. I was doing fundraisers, helping raise money for that. So once you got the drugs and alcohol out of your system yes. and you started living with better lifestyle choices, your, yep. your, your health naturally sort of came back. Yes. Well, that's amazing. So now I'm at this point where I'm doing MLM makeup stuff, but it didn't matter. I had a group of women around me right. and I was doing zoom meetings. So I had that network around me and then I knew I was in a toxic marriage and I had to get away, but I knew I was creating a plan. So I wasn't just sitting and it was like this beautiful thing happened. The fog started lifting and I was still angsty, angsty. And I, you know, those, the first, the jitters of early recovery. Um, but I knew I had a plan and I knew I believed in myself. Mm -hmm. And then I got an echocardiogram at six months sober and I had like 4% increase in my heart. And I was like, oh my God. That was unexpected to be. They told me I wouldn't have any increase, any cardiac increase if it didn't happen by year two. Mm -hmm. I'm coming up on year, November will be year five. I've been heart sick. So, I mean, any output or increase was amazing. So I stuck with it. I kept going to meetings and kept doing what they said there and kept cooking at home when I wanted to eat out and really watching my sodium and then n realizing I have to get mentally well too and spiritually well to keep my physical sobriety because so true. It, 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 it all goes it all hand in together. hand. So now here I am almost three years sober. Okay. So no alcohol. I'm 4% out of active heart failure. Needing a heart transplant is 35% cardiac output. I'm at 39%. That was eight months, six months ago. I need another echo coming soon. Um, but I'm out of active heart failure. I'm not in a crazy toxic relationship. I don't use any alcohol. My heart is better. I look good. I feel good. I just started a new business that's just trying to share my journey and teach people a lot of these maladaptations and like how we can unlearn what we know. Because a lot of it is, like you said, we just don't know what we don't know. Right. And we don't have to stay stuck. And there is a way out. And it doesn't matter. Like, I can share my story of being arrested, even though it's hard for me. I don't like telling people that stuff. But I know it helps someone. And It does. That's that's true. Um, I have I have more than one arrest story. Yeah, see? <laughs> uh, so your vibe maybe, maybe finds one, your tribe. <laughs> maybe one day I'll come on your podcast and yes, share. Yes, please do. Share my arrest story. So that's my health. Now it's it's I make mindful choices now. Like and there's work that goes into this. You have to be diligent about yeah, it sucks cooking when you're tired. Mm -hmm. But you have to do it. What's the alternative? Because my alternative is very real life. I'll immediately start fluid overloading. It'll affect my heart. Right. I'm not even, I'm not willing to deal with that. It'll put me back in the hospital. I don't have time for that. Are you able to maintain a fitness routine? Yeah. Okay. Um. So it's just modified modifieds, I call it. Because I still have, you know, pretty severe cardiac. Right. I'm still in advanced stage heart failure. So the endurance is yeah. a factor. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I have, I don't get as much oxygen in my blood. And so, but it's not an excuse to not move. I still have to be moving my blood at least 30 minutes. Um, that's actually what I started doing too at the beginning. Two miles a day, no matter what, I would go out and walk. Didn't matter where I was going, but there was a certain amount of steps I had to hit every day. I started losing weight. 
I started being able to breathe better. The fluid wasn't on as much. Then I learned how to cook. I started ordering HelloFresh because they were free and I was oh, poor. I've done it. Yeah. And I would make up a bunch of email addresses and get all these free foods. But I took their recipes and then I learned them. So now I'm learning how to cook and I'm learning how to put my spin on it and I'm learning how to make it taste good. And now I'm not fluid overloading as much and I'm starting to get better numbers at the doctor's There's office. There's really no downside because it's le- it's less expensive. Yeah. You know, you're, you're going to eat healthier. You're going to feel better. Yep. And then sort of that positive feedback loop. Yeah. You know, and you get to add things. extra things that you like more. It tastes better because right. it's just made Real. for you and not for like 15 other people it just takes a little time that's all it is it's our time that time that so you're in school working on your bachelor's that's another th- yeah, yeah i got out of treatment and i just fell into things that i needed to focus on that were positive positive. and i knew i still had gi bill left over from the army and on top of that when you use your gi bill they give you money to go to school mm-hmm. so that was another 1900 dollars a month i knew i would have and so i did it started going to school when i moved back and i graduate now October 23rd. That is so great to see a good example of how the program is supposed to work. I just yeah. haven't stopped. I, I just have to trust what everyone around me tells me that if you just keep doing the next right thing, everything will be okay. And so far, it hasn't not happened for me yet. That's great. Now, you have a website. Yes. It's tell, Remind me what it is. You are worth trying. You are worth trying. That's right. And it's where you write and talk about your journey and... Right so now, it's people just people can learn a little bit more about you. Yeah, uh, right. I know you're on Facebook, and your last name I've mispronounced it. How do you say it? Aylesworth. Aylesworth. That's, okay. Yeah, that's the Danny third Aylesworth. husband's last name. Gotcha. But it works because it has it's worth unique. at the end, and oh, okay. so I'm able to. You're worth it, Aylesworth. Well, you got to keep that going. Then I got to find that silver lining. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, man. Um, are you merchandising anything on yes. your way? So I have socks right now, and I'm calling on little reminders, and it just says worth it on the back so that you can look down um, throughout the day and remind yourself that you're worth yeah. reaching all your goals. I'll probably do, like, T-shirts and socks, too. The bread and butter will be, um, like I said, mod- just courses, online courses. And you can learn about cycles, and I didn't know about love bombing, and I didn't know about gaslighting, and I didn't know – about addictive cycles and trauma bonding and Ooh, love bombing. Now that's one I haven't heard before. Love bombing. Can you d- speak on that? Is it? It's. I guess it. Love bombing is just where you just move from one relationship. No, nope, okay. it's with one person. Where like if you know that they have an issue or they're upset about something or you know they're about to finally leave you, all of a sudden I love you. I'm getting you gifts. You're the best person. I love mm. you so much. I'll do anything for you. I'm so thankful for you. How did I get so lucky? Let's cuddle. Let's do movies. And I've, then I've never done that. <laughs> and then you fall back in now that to you the know habits. they're secure. Yeah. You go back. Ran to, them off in the first place. Correct. Gotcha. Love bombing. Uh, so and that's what your your undergraduate is in is in social work. Correct. And you're going to kind of incorporate that. Yes. With what you're doing. And yes. And the reason I went for social work at the time, I was doing my heart transplant stuff and my social work. Workers, my social workers on my care team for my heart transplant they were amazing they were the only people i had there for me and i was like eh, i guess we're going for st-. literally that's how i ended up with this degree i had gi bill left wanted the money per month they give you to go to school and my social workers were really nice to me and you will never cry from hearing a client's story ever, <laughs> ever. rule number one <laughs> the therapist cry. will not cry <laughs> and then watch me be like bawling Golly. oh yeah Well, um, I really appreciate uh, you coming in and telling us a little bit about your story. It's very nice to meet you. I hope you'll come back and keep me posted on kind of how it's going and, you know, new developments in in your social work uh, career as it comes on. I I know that's going to be a huge need around here. And we need somebody that's got a breadth of experience to pull from when talking to all of us uh, crazy people on this side. I'm one of the crazy people. That's right. I really want to say, though, that it's just important that people know that they're not alone. And that they don't have to stay stuck because I think I stayed in the dark for so long because I didn't think anybody else had gone through what I had gone through or I was the only one. And maybe by showing that there's maybe if they just see me and see there's one other person, they won't feel alone. They'll find the confidence to pull themselves out of that rut because we're worth it and we're worth feeling our best and we're worth reaching our goals and we're worth doing the things that will get us to where we want to be. So, I mean, just look at me. 
we've Shouldn't had a roller coaster. Yeah. yeah, and I've died twice. Thank God I had an internal defibrillator implanted four months prior to my two cardiac arrests or I wouldn't be here. Wow. Yeah, I've literally died two times. I mean, and I've been through all of this stuff, but I've made it through 100% of my bad times. I'm still here. Um, and it doesn't give you an excuse to be lazy or not kind to people or any of those things. Like, no, we can do it and we can do it together. So I appreciate you yeah. letting me kind of use my voice a little. Well, it's a beautiful message. Yeah. Thanks for coming thank in. Thank you. And congratulations on your journey. Thank you. How much? So, how so? Uh, a little over a year. Yay. That's a big deal. Yeah, it was a big deal. I didn't really want to tell anybody until I at least made it a year because yeah. that was a a goal for me and um, something happened deal. along the le- a way where I like being sober. Yeah. You know, it, it feels good to not have to worry about how I'm going to drive home mm. or how late I'm staying up or how early I have to get up or, or my kids going to be able to tell. Did you ever hide booze around? The oh, house? I was the king of hiding booze. Okay. Until you couldn't find it and then they find it before you. Find yeah. It. <laughs> um, my, my, my poor wife, I mean, she, she put up with it for a long time and, um, you know, it, 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 I did what a lot of people do and say, well, I'm not that bad. Yeah. You know, but, but, you know, how far do you have to walk into the forest before you're around the woods? You know, not very far, you know, you're there like as soon that. as you start getting there. So, um, but you know, it takes what it takes and I'm a stronger person because of all of that for yeah. sure. Um, and yeah, I'm just enjoying, you know, the trajectory I'm on right now. Cool. Yeah. I love it. I love my, the network, the family. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Okay. All right. That's it. That's it. (laughs) That's all she wrote.